so near? Is that why there's a there's a vibration? Oh, put it under like that. Put it here. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I'll try. Okay, so if um, snoring is actually a sound produced when there's a block of the airway, which can be from the nose to the back of the nose to the throat and even the lower part. So any part of the block of the airway can give you a sound that is snoring. All right. So for many of the uh, people, uh, it is the nose. Uh, for a lot of others, it's actually this palate. Palate is uh, this soft tissue that hangs down in the throat. And then for others, it's tonsils. Tonsils. Okay. And then the base of tongue, you can see the base of tongue. Some people have a very large tongue in relation to the mouth. And this can be falling backwards when they sleep. And this also blocks the airway. Uh, some, some people have very thick necks, very short necks. And so that also presses down on the lower airway. And so all this can lead to snoring. And for some others, it is many parts, many levels are blocked, leading to snoring. Uh, you may, when you read the internet or you know, uh, you read articles, you may hear sleep apnea a lot. Sleep apnea. So the short form is uh, OSA, obstructive sleep apnea, which is a block in the passage, leading to oxygen problem. All right. So the problem with obstructive sleep apnea is actually the worry that you may have oxygen problems in sleep. For snoring, some people actually uh, have blocks in the airway, but sometimes very rare cases, maybe five out of a hundred, there's actually a brain issue that makes them not breathe when they are sleeping, uh, not because of an airway block. So some snoring can be actually due to a brain issue. And uh, you read after, some people are worried that you know, they pass away in their sleep or something, and usually uh, these this are the more serious cases. When it's actually a brain issue, where your brain does not actually tell your body to breathe, to take a breath. All right? But fortunately, this uh, brain uh, type of snoring is actually much rarer. When, when you go to an ENT doctor or a, a lung doctor who looks into snoring, they will actually ask you to do a sleep study. So the sleep study really is important because not all snoring ends up in oxygen problem. So the sleep study will try to see whether you stop snoring many times an hour in sleep or is it just a few times. If you, snore only, uh, if you stop breathing only about 15 times, less than 15 times an hour, it's considered mild OSA. All right? If let's say there is a, you stop breathing about more than 30 times an hour is considered severe obstructive sleep apnea. More than 30 times an hour is actually quite serious. If you think about it, one hour is uh, 60 minutes. Sometimes when you stop breathing, it can be for a minute, one minute. If you stop breathing 30 times an hour, it's a bit hard to see there. Yeah. So if you stop breathing uh, 30, times an, uh, 30 times an hour and each time is for one minute, Half of the hour that you sleep, you are stopping breathing. You sleep seven hours or six hours, you times six or seven, it's a lot. Yeah? So it can be very dangerous. And um, oxygen, our normal oxygen saturation in the blood, we like it to be above 90%. Uh, but when you actually stop breathing, it can go down to even 50%. So that, that is actually a lot of damage. Yeah? Because when you sleep, your body is uh, supposed to be sleeping, resting, recharging, uh, healing itself. And if you have an oxygen problem for half the time when you're sleeping, you have a lot of side effects, as I'll show you. For children, it's even worse. Some people think that it's cute that the, the child is snoring in sleep. But actually, children should not be snoring. Okay, children should not be snoring. Even if there is one stoppage of breathing in one hour, it's abnormal for a kid. Unfortunately, many, many adults snore, more than 60%, and about 40% of kids snore. So sometimes you really do need to see a doctor to try and differentiate. Is this a dangerous snoring or is this not dangerous snoring? 
For the adult, uh, the um, males tend to snore more than the, than the females. But for the children, equal percentage, the guys and the, the kids, uh, male and female kids. For adult, there is slightly more obesity in those who snore. But for children, very, very underweight children. They can be underweight because they are snoring. They don't get nutrition. They have failure to thrive. And uh, for children who are snoring, they can be very hyperactive. A lot of the kids uh, who see me, the, the, they have been um, diagnosed as like uh, inattentive kids, bad behavior, hyperactive, cannot focus. Yeah? But actually, it is because they have been sleeping very poorly at night. And so their brains are very tired in the, in the morning. They, they wake up, they are irritable, they are grouchy, they are bad-tempered. One week after surgery or some, some treatment, you see a huge difference. The parents tell me they're like new kids. For the adults, however, they are not hyperactive. They are those with snoring, they are tired and sleepy. So they may get a bit of a headache in the morning. They, they feel like they, have, uh, they are very tired even though they have slept many hours. Um, because snoring, for snoring and disturbed sleep, your sleep is very poor quality. So you do not wake up and go walking around. You think you are sleeping. Uh, you, a lot of my patients tell me, no, I slept through the night. Uh, I did not wake from the bed. Yeah, we, we do not need to wake from the bed with the oxygen problem. The oxygen problem just makes you wake a little bit, but not enough to wake up and walk around. So it just means that uh, somebody wakes you up maybe seven, eight, nine times per hour, but you fall asleep again, okay? So because of that, your sleep quality is very poor. So you just imagine it's like running a marathon at night, all right? You're not recharging, you're not actually healing. So as we grow a bit older, uh, you're at risk, but uh, very young kids are also at risk for other reasons. Uh, for a lot of women, actually, uh, very underdiagnosed. Uh, the near menopause, many ladies actually uh, get uh, snoring. And then when they're pregnant, because of a lot of swelling and uh, a lot of blood flow, they also get, um, they also get snoring. Uh, these are lifestyle issues. Huh? If you are a bit overweight, if you take a lot of alcohol, smoking, all this worsen snoring. And for some people, it's just uh, genetically, if the whole family has been snoring, you tend to be a bit more predisposed. Uh, many, many Singaporeans have allergies, just it's in the environment, right? So uh, they have allergies, the nose is blocked, and because the nose is the first place where you start breathing, so it leads to snoring. Uh, for many children, there can be very large tonsils, yeah, tonsils uh, in the throat, uh, and adenoids. Uh, for example, like in this uh, x-ray, this is an x-ray for a kid. This lump here, the white lump, is adenoid tissue. Very big. It is blocking this whole nose passage. This part is supposed to be black. So air is supposed to come in here. Here is supposed to be black. You can see a total blockage. Air cannot come down here. So what does the kid do or the adult? They breathe through the mouth. Okay, so you may see that the child is always a little bit open mouth breathing. His mouth is not very big, open, just a little bit. The lips are not closed, just a bit like that. Okay, at night he sleeps, stretched out, he's trying very hard to sleep. In a, he's trying, it's like survival instinct. He's stretched out to try and get air. Okay, he's turning, tossing all over the bed, sometimes sweating. Yeah, he's just very distressed in sleep. But the adults tend to just lie in the same position and sleep blocked. The kids tend to move around, uh, very actively in bed, even in sleep. So, uh, so for, for this one looks cute, right? But actually this kid, why this is the classical sign of a blocked breathing, you know? This is a classical sign of a blocked breathing because his uh, adenoid that I showed you, the x-ray, yeah, is blocked. So he can't lie back on his, he can't lie back. It's very blocked. He tries to lie forward, sleep on his stomach, so that everything, the tongue, everything falls, Forward, the palate falls forward so that he can sleep. All right, uh, and for a lot of adults, maybe they what scares the spouse is that they snore and then they hold their breath for one to two minutes, and then you are worried and you wake them up because you think they stop breathing, right? Okay, and then suddenly they choke, and then they start breathing again. For adults, all right, kids may be a little bit different. Kids may be doing all this, and a lot of children who actually have uh, snoring. 
are bed wetting, you know, they cannot control the bladder, even at three, four years old. They are bed wetting. It is not because they are naughty or what, they sometimes just cannot because the oxygen lack is um, like a distress signal to the bladder. So the bladder has to let go, okay, it cannot be dry. Day after treatment, they immediately they are dry, you know, they don't even need the pampers. Okay, so for, for the, um, this one, I think for the adults, huh? so like you, some people say, well, my memory is poor, I cannot, the kids say the IQ is poor, cannot concentrate. Uh, some adults come to me, say the mouth very dry, bad breath. Actually, it's all because your nose is blocked, your mouth breathing at night. Uh, then reduce sex drive, acid reflux also. The, when you are breathing very hard, taking a very deep breath in, you're creating a negative pressure such that the acid from the stomach is pulled upwards. So some people are on a lot of reflux medicine, but it's because they're snoring. It's not controlled. And then, of course, it's underestimated uh, by, by the women. Huh? So with, uh, with actually prolonged, even in kids and into adulthood, prolonged mouth breathing with a nose block, you end up with a face that is a bit longer because their mouth is always, the jaw is always a bit lower. The lower jaw does not grow forward because the mouth is always a bit open, the muscle pull is down. The lower jaw does not grow forward means the tongue is forced backwards. When you lie back down, the tongue falls backwards. The problem is that in the first maybe five years of life, especially, if your jaw is not closed and does not grow forward properly, you will never get a proper formed jaw as you grow. Okay, and so you are fixed as an adult with a slightly uh, receded chin some of you may find that the, the dentition, the, dent, the upper teeth do not meet the lower teeth. The upper teeth is a bit forward compared to the lower teeth a bit backwards. These are all because of mouth breathing, nose block that was not treated when young. So unfortunately, after 12, the face is fixed. Uh, and then it becomes a lot harder to treat as a snorer, the adult, because no longer is it just treating nose problems. You start to have to do jaw surgery, bring the jaw forward, wire and all that, so it's a lot harder. Yeah, so try to treat early. So for the problems for an adult uh, with uh, snoring, you can see it's a quite very large increase in risk. They have shown very clearly now that an adult who snores, okay, even with a mild to moderate snoring, not severe, there is three times increase at least, if it's severe, it's five times increase. Three times increase at least of early memory issues, dementia, hypertension. You keep treating the hypertension, but it just keeps needing more and more drugs. You try your best, you live a high, healthy lifestyle, you're doing everything you can, you hardly eat, but still your high blood pressure is very hard to control. It may be just because you're snoring and you do not know that snoring is a problem. They can worsen all this. Yeah, many adults are depressed, but uh, a lot of us just think, oh, we are working too hard, we, <laughs> we, are, trying to, we are trying to get by, so we are depressed, it's normal. No, don't, don't accept that, okay? You, you all can be happy. Yeah, so there a lot of road accidents they have found. Snoring, not sleeping well, is as bad as drinking alcohol. As bad as drinking alcohol associated with road accidents. And uh, heart attacks, of course, heart attacks, diabetes, strokes, these are all oxygen-related. What we, tr we try so hard to treat hypertension uh, because we, we know that it's a risk factor for, high, for um, stroke, for heart attack, um, because those lead to narrowing of the arteries. But oxygen lack is a very important contributor because an oxygen lack is, uh, can you imagine, with you eight hours of the night, stressing your heart. Your heart has to work three to five times as hard to pump, all right? Not resting. So that, that is why all these risks are greatly increased. So when you go to the doctor, some t many times, okay, uh, if it's not a simple case of snoring, they may have to do a sleep study. Previously, sleep studies have to be done in the hospitals. So a lot of patients, my patients don't like it. They say it's hard to sleep, I waste my time, I paid a lot of money, and uh, the results are not uh, reflective. Um, but fortunately nowadays, uh, for 95% of patients, Actually, we can do a home sleep study. So very easy, I do this for my husband also. So uh, you can, it's just a watch-like thing, watch-like thing that you wear, okay, around your wrist. And uh, it has an oximeter here. 
Uh, but there are some other electrodes that we paste onto the body. Okay, so it's not those simple, it's not the Fitbit thing, Th those cannot, your new Apple Watch cannot, okay, cannot um, uh, diagnose uh, sleep apnea. But uh, because there are actually extra electrodes monitoring, chest movements, uh, uh, and also other oxygenation issues, all right? Okay, so this, you sleep overnight, you bring this home with you, uh, my nurse will tell you what to do and all that. You, you bring it back the next day, we run it through a program, and we are able to tell you uh, how severe your oxygen lack is. Is it something that you can do nothing about, just modify lifestyle, uh, do a bit of nasal obstruction control, or is it something you really have to watch out for? Yeah. For many children, they do not need a sleep study unless they have some syndromes, uh, or some medical issues, but adults, many of them may need a sleep study. Sometimes we do some other tests to see whether it's the structure of your face, your tongue, uh, the jaw, and in very serious cases, we may have to actually do a scope when you're actually sleeping, uh, but that's under general anesthesia. Maybe only 5% of cases need to do this. The rest, just a sleep study would do. So if it's a very, very mild case of snoring, uh, then you do the usual, huh? healthy lifestyle kind of thing. Weight loss, exercise, eat a healthy diet, avoid alcohol uh, after dinner if you can, because that really, you lose your muscle tone, you start snoring, all right? Uh, sleeping pills tend to make things worse, like antidepressants, sleeping pills, tend to make the snoring a little bit worse. But if you have to take uh, an antidepressant and all that prescribed by your doctor, then please go ahead and take it, all right? It's, uh, it's important. Um, of course, you can try to sleep to one side. Some people find that sleeping to one side makes the snoring less. But not everybody can sleep on one side. You can, uh, some people have shoulder problems, neck problems. Some uh, men, they have broad shoulders. Telling them to sleep to one side is really difficult. Yeah, and they end up with pains elsewhere also. Okay, so um, if, you, if, this is, uh, if you sleep on one side and you're okay, um, sometimes you think that you're sleeping on one side, you, you start the night sleeping on one side, but by the middle of the night, maybe you're actually sleeping on your back. Okay, it's just that everybody is asleep and nobody is hearing your snoring. Usually the start is hard to sleep, yeah? Okay, and then for very simple ones, sometimes if it's just, if the doctor has seen you, it's just due to allergy, not due to structure, you can actually treat allergies for the blocked nose and that may be all that is needed. Oh, sorry, just a long ass. So for, I, I spent a little bit of time on the allergy because it's very common and it's very simple and doesn't need surgery. So like the allergies common in Singapore, uh, we all share the same air. No matter what food you eat, you share the same air, okay? We can modify the environment a bit in our house, but not so easy if you are sharing an office and all that. The top allergy in Singapore actually is house dust mites. So many people think that house dust mites are only in dirty homes. They get really offended when I test them and then I tell them you have dust mites that you're allergic to. They say, no, no, my home is very clean. Well, but I tell them, no, it's in the cleanest of homes. Okay, house dust mites are in every home because why Singapore is um, very humid and it is very hot. So house dust mites love hot, humid conditions. You go to Canada or someplace very cold, the Arctic and all that, no house dust mites. You go to London during winter, you may think you'll be worse your nose, but there are no house dust mites, your nose is clearer. That's, that's the reason. The second most common allergy in Singapore is actually the cockroaches or the fungus. The cockroaches are even also in the cleanest of homes. Huh? We, we can do pest control, that's the good thing. Yeah? And we, pest control for cockroaches. But if you are actually quite near sewers, quite near the rubbish chutes and all that, you share a common sewage thing, it's not easy to always control the cockroach. Um, and you do not need to see the cockroach running around. It doesn't mean there must be a cockroach running around your house for you to be allergic to the cockroach. The cockroach lay eggs, the eggs uh, break down like powder, it is in the air. So sometimes it's hard to actually um, uh, get rid of them, okay? But nowadays for like dust mites, cockroach, uh, even grass, tree pollens and all that, we have what we call immunotherapy. Uh, that Immunotherapy is a little bit different from allergy medicine. Like for dust mite allergy, let's say there's dust mite in your bedroom, you start sneezing, you have blocked nose, you have runny nose, morning and night. 
uh, if you cannot control the environment very well, you know, after we have given advice and all that, instead of uh, getting rid of the dust mites, you make your own body not react to the dust mites. It's a bit like vaccinations, like getting a flu shot. So even if the dust mite is in your room, you do not react to it, yeah? So if, let's say, environmental control does not work well, now there's immunotherapy, and it's quite easy, like uh, just one tablet uh, dissolves under your tongue in one minute, and uh, you do that for a month, a few months, and best results are if you do that every day for two years. It'll give you like a 10, 20 year dust mite free kind of uh, allergic reaction, all right? And uh, mold and fungus, very common, and also hot, humid weather, a lot of fungus and mold. Again, you do not need to see it. It doesn't mean your walls must be black or green. Uh, you do not see the mold and fungus, even if it's uh, just um, maybe your washroom, your toilet, uh, water there, and then it doesn't ventilate well. There can be mold and fungus that you can't see with your eye. And you can be sensitive to it. Blocked nose, a bit of phlegm, a bit of throat irritation. Uh, not, most adults do not have bad sneezing, unlike the kids. The kids tend to be more sneezing and all that. All right, uh, Just blocked nose. So for, for many children, they also have this extra thing which is food allergy. Food allergy, people thought usually, like, oh, you, you must have a rash around the mouth, then it's a food allergy. But actually, many food allergy present just with a blocked nose. All right, so if you do not test for it with uh, allergy testing, you may not know. And uh, some, many parents have the mistaken idea that uh, food allergy must be to uh, food that you rarely eat. So they say, uh, cannot be, I, uh, they, they are eating eggs every day. But a lot of times, the, egg, uh, the allergy is to things that you're eating every day. So we call this like a hidden kind of food allergy. It's not the obvious reaction, like you go into shock or you can't breathe. Those are very easy. Those I do not need to test. Yeah, so what we test for are those hidden food allergies. And you can see that 90% are actually due to eggs, milk. I would say this too, uh, soy also, makes up almost 80%, you know. And then uh, in the uh, Caucasian population, they tend to have a bit more peanuts, nuts, all this. Okay, so again, this must be tested for. And testing early for the kids and even for the adults is good because uh, actually treating your allergy prevents you from going into childhood asthma or prevents you from getting asthma as an adult. Some adults ask me, why is it I was well as a kid for 20 over years and now I'm getting asthma? Some of them are actually uh, allergy-induced. It does not mean that if as a kid you had no allergies, you cannot have allergy as an adult. They can come on as an adult. So for the... Uh, for This one looks a bit gross, right? But it's a, this kid, or this, no, this adult had a very large tongue. So uh, this is actually a gadget to pull the tongue forward in sleep. Many people... These are, uh, many things are sold on the internet. 2,000 over things are sold on the internet to try and do things to help you breathe. But it is very important actually to see the doctor first, to see where exactly is your block and not use all this. It may be the wrong thing, okay? And uh, of course, this is not very tolerable after one or two days. I mean, the first one, two days you can, but by the, after a while, you get a bit of a sore. Uh, some, some patients also uh, may need some retainers for the teeth and the jaw. Really, these retainers are to pull forward your lower jaw. Remember I told you your lower jaw may be a bit receded, tongue falling backwards. So they are trying to pull this forward a little bit. And sometimes we have to uh, actually advance them a little bit, like 0 0.5 centimeter, 1 centimeter after a few weeks and months. But there is a certain limit to what you can do because it starts to put a strain on the muscles, on the joints, they start to get painful. Yeah, so you cannot overdo it also. There's a limit. And we work with the dental uh, colleagues to do this. This is an oxygen uh, CPAP mask. It's called a CPAP mask. It stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. A lot of people don't like to use this, of course. Huh? But actually, nowadays, it's getting very light. It's very portable. It's actually really small, like that. Okay, and it is a lot more comfortable. Previously, it used to use very high pressures, but now the pressures are a lot more tolerable. People even carry it with them, actually, when they fly uh, and all that. Um, so the, many of us would want to have the very small mask that is just onto the nose, but actually a bigger mask 
is a lot more comfortable. Not so much pressure, uh, and it fits better when you move around in bed and all that. It doesn't slip off. But the best mask fit, we will try. We will not. It's, it's not one size fits all. So there's actually a trial, um, if you need one, uh, to find a suitable mask, and the person will work with you to actually um, help, uh, help you ease into this. This is very useful, why? Because you actually can get the flow right to the nose, the back of the nose, the throat, all the way down to the lungs. Even if you have multiple sites of block, nose, throat, everything, it gives you 100% oxygen, all right? Just that some people tell me, no, kill me, don't do anything to me, do all kinds of surgery, but I don't want to wear this mask. Okay, so it's a personal preference, so uh, we, we have to respect that, yeah? But if uh, in some cases, I will still insist, I will tell them surgery does not cure 100%, uh, and the best for you is this mask. Surgery is useful if the mask cannot be tolerated, if it's a mouth thing, it's just a nose thing, you know? If it's uh, just a tongue, just a tonsil, not multi-level, then it's helpful. Surgery can be helpful. And then you do not need to wear this mask. Um, so in the clinic, we always start with doing a scope for the nose to see where the obstruction is. The obstruction can be from the turbinate tissues, which are, the bone is in the center. There are two soft tissue at the side. And uh, this can be, become very, very huge, okay? Either with allergy or because for a, you're just anatomically, your bone structure is just big and blocking. So some people have polyps in the nose. Some people have a very crooked bone. The center bone is not straight. It is crooked and digging into the sides. So it's really blocking the nose. Uh, so all this surgery can be done, yeah? Surgery can be done for all this. For the kit just now that I showed you the x-ray, very large adenoid at the back. This, when we do a scope, we can see this huge adenoid at the back. Very simple surgery, just actually 15 minute surgery. You can remove this and then the kid can breathe well. All right, these are very big tonsils, very big tonsils. Uh, tonsils are supposed to be just here, here. These are so big, it's nearly kissing. I call them kissing tonsils. Yeah, some people have really big tongue. Like this, you can see uh, this, um, a normal anatomy for the mouth. When you look up, this is the soft palate. This palate should not be too far down. When the tongue is, when you stick the tongue out, you should be able to see some air space. For this patient, you don't see any air space, which means the palate is very low lying. The tongue is very big. Very likely as a kid had been blocked, jaw did not grow very big, so the tongue in relationship is very crowded in that space. And then they may need actually some palate surgery. This one will need a tonsil <coughs> surgery. For some patients, we actually reduce the size of the back of the tongue. Don't show you gory pictures, huh? Okay, then for some, uh, for some uh, kids and adults, uh, we have to actually expand the jaw. The upper jaw can be very narrow. The upper jaw, this is the upper jaw. They can, it is narrow because the kid or the adult has been breathing through the mouth, blocked nose. And if you imagine the, the, the upper jaw, the, the roof of the upper jaw is actually the floor of the nose. So if it's very narrow, the nose base is very narrow. So when you expand this, you think you're expanding the jaw, but actually what we're trying to do is to expand the floor of the nose to give you also more space. Okay, and then of course the, the lower jaw, if it's very narrow, we can also uh, do surgery to expand it and all that. Uh, but many patients nowadays would prefer to actually use the CPAP machine because it's easier and not such big surgeries. All right? So less and less people are choosing this kind of big surgeries. Uh, okay, uh, I'll end here. And uh, if I can do anything for you, let me know. Uh, we have allergy testing and uh, we have the sleep study in our clinic. Uh, we, we do sleep study for kids uh, four years and above to adults. Um, and uh, I, I have to leave to the airport soon, but I welcome some questions now. Yeah, thank you. Some people prefer to do it at home. Some people prefer to do it at home. Some people to uh, help them with the insurance. They want to do it in the hospital. 
some, uh, for some insurance, if you do it in hospital, they actually pay for it. But having said that, insurance are very, uh, very few pay for uh, orders. They do not think it's uh, harmful, but actually there's a lot of uh, problems. So what we have to do, you know, when we work with the insurers, we, we don't uh, just put an outright sleep disorder, unless it's really a sleep disorder. Many of these are not sleep disorders, they're because of obstruction. So we'll see an obstructed nose, obstructed soft palate, base of heart. Some of the machines with, uh, like, they have HEPA filters and all that, right? So those are helpful, but uh, not helpful enough, okay? Because uh, the, a lot of the dust mites are actually in your beds, blankets, pillows, bolsters, uh, carpets, uh, curtains, um, bookshelves, all right? There are paper mites, huh, which are also dust mites. So to kill the dust mites, you really need 60 degrees hot water. No use sunning them. Sun is 35 degrees at maximum. 30, uh, 60 degrees hot water, either in the washing machine or you need to pour hot water over first before you put into the machine. Yeah, and uh, you do that at least once a week. Sometimes the very old mattresses you may have to change or you may have to buy a dust mite cover for the whole mattress. Uh, that, that is more helpful. And to keep things really spartan. Hardly, you know, don't have open bookshelves in your room. Don't have thick duvets, very comfortable. Things, the, the more spartan, the better. The things that you can wash uh, easily, you know, dry. Yeah, keep things simple. Some people even don't use curtains, they use blinds so that you can wipe down, no carpets. And if all else fails, then you think about immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Yes. Oh, uh, your question is what? How to treat the bedroom, is it? Oh, aircon the whole bedroom. The aircon is actually, some people tell me, they say that um, uh, the aircon seems to make me worse, the allergy. Yeah, but actually it's not, it's not that. Huh? I think it's because they associate the aircon, because at night when you sleep, the aircon is on. So at night is when the dust mites are there, you're in the bedroom. Yeah, so they, they think it's due to the aircon, but actually it's the dust mite. The aircon is actually better for people with dust mite allergy and fungus allergy, because the aircon dries up uh, the room, so it's actually better, but you do not want the aircon blowing at you. And you need to remember to service the aircon. If the aircon is dirty, then it's worse. Yeah. People who are very allergic, very sensitive, they are uh, sometimes sensitive to a few things. So like if you have a dust mite allergy, you tend to be a bit more sensitive to cold air, change in temperature, pollution. Pollution is actually not dust. You know? uh, so like there are a lot of uh, army boys who want to get out of army. So they say, I have dust mite allergy, write me a letter, I don't need to go army. But uh, I told them then there's no more army in Singapore because 40% of us are allergic to dust mites. And uh, the dust in army is not dust mites. Uh. The, the army actually have the least dust mites. They are very spartan, you know. They only have one single mattress <laughs> for you. Everything is uh, bare, okay. And it's not even pollutants in the road and the traffic and all that. Those are dust but not house dust mites. We are not allergic to dust. Um, we are more allergic to house dust mites. But if your house dust mite allergy, you are a little bit more sensitive to other things. Maybe perfumes, change of weather, some common dust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've gone to sleep clinic twice. Yes. Stressful. stressful. <laughs> In fact, it didn't help at all. Uh -huh. So just now you're talking about this watch. Yes, yes. Uh, is it, uh, how much is this treatment? The, the watch pad is $800. Ah, okay. uh, $800. The, I think the question was that she has gone to a uh, sleep clinic, sleep study, isn't it? Sleep study twice. Why did you need to do two times? The first time... Couldn't I sleep, isn't it? It was very bad. Okay. <laughs> the second time, I only slept two hours. Okay. But they say it's mild because I didn't sleep at 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. So, so I think last time people used to insist you go to the hospital to sleep, but because it didn't work so well, and for ninety-five percent of patients who don't need that, there is there are five percent of cases with severe neurology issues and all that you need the full sleep study. But for the rest, actually, the watch pad is quite simple. Yeah, most people are able to sleep with that. In fact, you have to wake them up. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes. Yeah, so the humidifier is bad for dust mites. Huh? Humidifier, it makes it humid. Yeah, the dust mites like a humid and warm area. Uh, so actually, I tell people, you don't need humidifier in Singapore. Singapore is very humid. Yeah, if you were staying in a cold country and all that, I would say you need a humidifier. Uh, so you do not need a humidifier. In fact, I tell my patients sometimes to buy a dehumidifier. Uh, but don't use the dehumidifier when you're around because it's quite uncomfortable, it's very dry. So I tell them to dehumidify the room when everybody is out of the house. When you come back, you turn off the dehumidifier, all right, and then uh, that's comfortable for you. Air purifier is good for maybe all these things like the haze and all that, nah? but doesn't help tremendously, I would say, the house dust mite. Yeah. You're better off maybe spending money buying those very expensive vacuums if you really want to buy something. <laughs> I'm glad there's so many questions on allergy because allergy is something you can really control. You know, it's within your control and it does uh, actually, uh, a lot of cases for snoring, it is one big problem in Singapore and it's a non-surgical uh, issue so it's something you can do initially, all right? Uh, okay, thank you so much, okay? Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for your time, Dr. Lim. Uh, we actually have a token of appreciation oh, for you. Thank, Thank you very you so much. much. <laughs> Thank you.